All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I appreciate the opportunity to talk here at the conference. I hope some people caught Eric's session earlier. We've got a bit of a triathlon or a quadrathlon of open layers talks going on. Eric spoke just before the break and gave a really good introduction to open layers. I'm talking now and um, I'm going to basically just give you a lot of demos of what the library can do and show you what the API looks like. And following me, Tom will talk about some of the internals and, um, and give you a look under the hood of open layers. And finally, Cedric will follow up um, and discuss a little bit about how <laughs> Uh, we launched this fundraising campaign and um, how that really helped uh, the, us tackle this development effort. So I previously had titled my talk, Application Development with Open Layers. Um, it's now called Working with Open Layers. We've sort of reshuffled to accommodate um, having these four talks in a row. There's going to be some redundant material for those that were here uh, at Eric's talk, but I hope it's not too much overlap. Um, I work for Boundless Geo. This is formerly Open Geo, and um, I just wanted to thank my employer for allowing me to participate in Open Layers development for uh, the past six years. Um, the Open Layers three development effort has really been a collaborative effort, and I'll leave uh, you to come to Cedric's talk to hear a little bit more about that. But it's mainly a, um, it's an effort that we we fundraised for, and we have um, developers participating from. Uh, a number of companies, primarily Camp to Camp and Boundless, um, also Terrestris, and we um, encourage developers from, from all different places. So I typically start uh, Open Layers talks with a bit on the history of Open Layers, and I find myself actually going pretty long and talking about how we've been around for seven years, and um, I show graphs of how the project has grown and how we've uh, um, brought on new contributors and added new features. And I always find myself too short at the end on time for showing um, demos. So I wanted to sort of flip that around and say, OK, forget the history. Let's dispense with that and go straight to the demos. And uh, I don't mean that we're forgetting about our history or I don't think that's important. It actually is very significant that we have taken seven years of experience with uh, working with Open Layers 2. Um, and though we have thrown away all the code and started over, We've really uh, learned a lot from that experience and embedded that knowledge uh, in the development of this new library. So uh, it's a bit of a risk, I think, to have an entirely demo-driven talk, but it seems like the connection is working out, and kudos to the, the conference organizers for making that possible. Um, the way I'll drive this is just by setting up a simple goal. So we'll look at a, an objective, pretending you're sitting down to develop an application. This is something you might want to do, just put a simple map on a page. Then I'm going to show you what it looks like in Open Layers code. So this is a, um, a, uh, your first introduction to the Open Layers uh, 3 API. One thing to notice is um, we have this separation of a map and a view. A map is the primary object that you interact with when working with an Open Layers application. Um, but it's very important to know about the view. This example shows the construction of a 2D view, and all the examples I'll show you use that same view. We've designed Open Layers to uh, be able to, Open Layers 3, to be able to accommodate different views, so we will have a 3D <coughs> view eventually. And a lot of the initial uh, impetus for, for developing Open Layers 3 was to be able to provide 3D views, to be able to provide kind of limited 2.5D uh, views oblique views with extruded buildings or extruded terrain, um, but also uh, potentially to deal with more complex 3D views. So in this example, I've given a view uh, center. It's just an array of values, uh, two values in this case, and a zoom. Uh, a view in general takes um, resolution and rotation values as well. And zoom is sort of a shorthand um, convenience for indicating um, which resolution, assuming the defaults of uh, the default uh, tile levels for a spherical Mercator tile set. Then I construct a map and I point it to some viewport in the DOM. This map string is the identifier of a, of a div element, let's say, in the DOM. And I give it a list of layers and I give it that view. And let's see what that looks like. So there we have your basic uh, hello world from um, open layers. I can uh, double click to zoom in here drag to pan. I've got the expected um, sort of default controls, a, a zoom button here to do the same thing. So pretty basic, something you'd expect to accomplish with, um, with any mapping library. And that's how we do it in Open Layers 3. 
So moving on from there, the next thing you want is to use different sources. That example I showed you used an OSM uh, data source. Um, and that, uh, I didn't show how it was created in that previous example, but this is how you would do that. You'd use a uh, tile layer. And then you give that layer a source. So again, this is an example of the separation of concerns Eric mentioned in the previous talk, and I think Tom will be giving a little bit more justification for in his talk. Um, but my quick explanation of it is that a layer represents the view, how, this, how you want the, the data source to be rendered in the map. And the source represents how to fetch that data. So for, I'll be talking for, um, a, in a few examples about vector data. Um, in these examples, it's using uh, tiled raster data. Um, so this source knows about the URL for those tiles, the URL scheme, it knows how to get them. And those tiles might come from um, well, different tile providers. It could come from local storage, or you could be using an entirely different protocol, not HTTP, to mm -hmm. gather those tiles. Um, but that's what the source does. You can use that same uh, layer. So this is, again, using the tile layer. But in this case, it's using a Bing Maps source. So uh, the OSM source doesn't take any special configuration. This Bing Maps source requires that you provide a key. You go register for an API key for Bing Maps, and then you have to choose which style. And uh, here's the aerial um, imagery layer with labels. So I'll show an example demonstrating a couple different uh, tile sources. In the first example, we saw OSM. Here's MapQuest's rendering of OSM. Uh, Bing's aerials. Um, you can use tiles from other providers. Stamen is a, is a, a nice design company that provides nice um, tiles available for use. Um, people probably know of Mapbox. This is their geography class layer. Uh, this is a tile JSON layer. So it uses the, uh, this tile JSON um, protocol, kind of community protocol, to go out and fetch information about the metadata, the, um, the origin of the tiles and what the tile lattice is. And then it configures the source for you. So this is an interesting example. It's actually something that was a bit awkward in Open Layers 2 to do. But these sources can be asynchronously configured. So in this case, the application developer doesn't know everything about the, uh, the configuration of this tile grid or the tile matrix set. Um, but you just specify how you can get that information. This source goes out, fetches the capabilities, and then it configures the, that source. And when it's available, it will be rendered in your map. So a lot going on behind the scenes there. Um, but the important part for you is it's just easy to, to use. And of course, you can just use um, any general XYZ layers. So I want to play around with the map and, and show off a couple other features here. I already showed you this animated zooming. When I click, uh, I shouldn't be centering on my home over here. You guys help me find where we are now. Um, one thing that you should be able to see, I, as I zoom in, uh, we have, pardon? Up. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'd rather just uh, fly around the map and not really care where I end up, I guess. But um, so I'm going to I'm going to zoom in here, and because of the latency here, you can you can watch the tiles load. I've given talks on the, and tried to demonstrate this before. And when you have a very fast connection, um, of course, you can't see that um, uh, it's not as pronounced. But it does demonstrate something that I, I want to show you. So I've zoomed in here over Bir Birmingham. And now I'm going to pan over to the side. And you can see, that instead of going off the map and seeing the, what's beyond the edge of the world, um, you see these lower resolution tiles. And then, as I sit and wait, the, uh, the tiles at my target resolution are loaded. So this provides a really nice effect, um, particularly <coughs> with, with imagery. So I will I'll push this map out a little bit and look at tiles that are I probably already got lower or loaded. Um, but you can see as I pan over here, I get these lower resolution tiles that are shown sort of as a placeholder, and then the um, tiles at the appropriate resolution come in. And there's some really sophisticated tile handling going on behind the scenes here as well. Uh, there's a tile queue that determines the, um, the priority of the, um, the tiles that are fetched. And it is prioritized around the focus of my mouse. So as I uh, zoom in to this location, tiles at where my mouse is over on that side will be prioritized. So those will be loaded first, and then these other tiles come in after that. So some really nice tile handling. I hope I haven't stolen too much of Tom's thunder. It's largely kudos to him, but um, uh, I think that's really great um, 
and it, it provides a really nice experience for the user. I also, um, am, I'm not going to demonstrate it in this example, but it's important to note as well that uh, we're using these standard resolutions, standard zoom levels for these XYZ tiles that are available here. But OpenLayers 3 has the capability to, to fetch tiles at um, a resolution that is available on the server and then display them at any resolution on the client. And that's sort of what you're seeing when you're seeing these uh, lower resolution tiles displayed in the background. But you don't have to just restrict your map to the standard zoom levels that are available on, the ser on your server. You can uh, zoom to any resolution and we will scale that, that, um, those raster data sources at the display that you've chosen on the client. So that's a little bit about uh, layers and sources, working with raster sources in particular. Um, in the previous examples, I've talked about some of the, um, the interaction that you want to do and, and shown the controls that are on the map. Um, you might want to uh, provide more control to your user than we provide by default. So it's important to know about these two concepts, the interaction and control. In Open Layers 3, interactions are things that have no visible representation or no representation in the DOM. And they literally just take uh, browser events and compose them into higher level events or um, take some action and let's say move your map. So the drag interaction is just a very basic thing that takes uh, browser events and composes them into a drag, a drag sequence. Drag start, drag, drag end. And that can be used to do things like drag rotate the map. Um, I'll show you that in a second. You've seen drag panning as I go through. There's also, there are also touch related interactions. So touch zoom um, works on, on mobile devices. And then keyboard interactions that can make your map accessible. So you can uh, allow the user to focus your map with a tab key or something and then use the, the keyboard to interact with the map. Controls, by contrast, are things that do have a representation in the DOM. So the zoom control provides those buttons where I was zooming in and out on the map. Uh, the scale line control, I'll show you in just a second, displays a, a scale line on your map, et cetera. So uh, we're trying to maintain that distinction and, and we're um, sort of testing this division in the architecture as we go. Uh, Maybe that we have and our uh, idea is to have interactions that are reusable so you can have a control that orchestrates a number of different interactions and turns them on and off um, and takes advantage, reuses these interactions in multiple controls. So this example has a couple um, non-default um, controls built in. I, the first example I showed you, I didn't touch <coughs> controls when I created a map. Um, in this example, I have extended the default controls with custom ones. So the one up here in the top is this scale line control. Um, if you've got really good eyes and watch that, um, you should see as I zoom in and out that that scale line uh, is animated with the, the resolution on the map. So it's showing the uh, resolution at the center of the map at all times. If I uh, zoom way out here, you should see that even as I change the center, the, uh, the, the scale line changes because we're, um, we're changing resolution as we go further north in that case. So that's a scale line control. I mentioned the zoom controls. Those let you uh, zoom in and out. Another uh, uh, control that we have included um, but that is not enabled by default is this geolo geolocation control. So I'm going to see if I can locate ourselves here. And uh, that gets our location and, and bounces in. I'm going to zoom in a bit further here, see if it was close. At least I saw Nottingham there. Anybody start recognizing campus? Yeah, that's been the name. <laughs> All right, so I can uh, explore around here, hit locate again, and see if it takes us down. Seems like it did find us accurately. So one thing I mentioned but haven't shown yet is this rotation, uh, drag rotation interaction. So I'm going to alt shift drag and I can rotate the map around the center. Um, if you're looking carefully up at the far top right, you can see a little slider there that changes as I rotate the map around. Um, and this is a uh, HTML5 has added uh, the range type input. So this is just an input that takes a, a value, a rotation value. Um, and if you provide this range type, supported browsers will actually show you a, a little slider like this. 
And what I'm showing you here is this two-way binding um, between that input element and the maps map view uh, rotation. So as I move this slider, the map rotates. As I move, uh, as I rotate the map with the drag rotation interaction, the slider moves. And the library allows you to, um, to <coughs> do that sort of two-way binding <coughs> with things like input elements um, or other um, elements in your application. I'm already in full screen, but if you weren't in full screen, we provide a, uh, a full screen control that um, expands your map to full screen, gives a really nice immersive experience. Um, and um, so those are some custom controls uh, that you can add um, to and extend the defaults with. Okay, next goal might be to work with vector data. All I've shown you so far is working with raster data, with raster tiles. Um, but a uh, big focus in open layers three is working efficiently with vector layers. So I, previously I was showing you tile layers and uh, tile sources. Um, in this example, it's a vector layer. We're using a, the um, base vector source. And here I've just given it uh, the URL path to my data, and I've told it this is going to be GeoJSON. Um, we currently have support for GeoJSON, TopoJSON, GML, KML, GPX, uh, vector data sources. Did I miss any? Um, and we're expanding that list. So we plan to have feature parity with Open Layers 2 in terms of the wide variety of uh, formats su supported there. Um, <laughs> And again, those allow you to, to use the same, this source describes where the data is coming from, and then I tell it what format it's in, and uh, the <coughs> library will parse it for you, transform coordinates on the fly, and then render those. So uh, looking at the vector layer example, here is just a, a um, countries data set. As I a zoom in here, you can see labels coming in. One thing I want to mention about the, uh, the vector rendering, this isn't, you can see uh, it's pretty low quality data here, but um, <coughs> one of the things that's worked into the vector renderer right now is this internal tiled rendering. So while you're animating, while I'm zooming in and out or doing this animated pan, I'm not actually going back to the data and, and re-rendering with every um, move. I'm using cached uh, vector tiles from the previous render and, and using those to display uh, while we're in this animated transition between resolutions. It may be that we change the strategy for this. We're experimenting with strategies that are um, going to be the most efficient for, for rendering um, large amounts of data and still providing really nice interactivity. So that was a pretty boring example. Didn't have much style, uh, just white polygons with blue outlines. Um, the next thing you might want to do is give your uh, layer some style. So the style handling in Open Layers 3 is, is pretty sophisticated. We uh, intend on making it as convenient as possible. Uh, this example shows creating a style with two symbolizers. So this is a, a fill symbolizer and a stroke symbolizer. And if you give it polygon data, that will render your polygons with a fill and stroke. If you were to give that line data, it would just stroke them. And uh, if you were to give it point data, that, that wouldn't render them at this point. I can talk to people afterwards about how to render point data. I don't have an example of that. Um, so that was just saying render all my data in the same way. Typically what you want to do is provide some sort of selector, some filter. I want to render this portion of my data in one way and, an, and the rest of my data in another way. So in CSS, th these are selectors and then your uh, style declaration. In uh, open layers, we have rules. So rules um, have a filter which represents your selector. In this case, I'm saying I just want uh, the highways to be rendered with this symbolizer, so a three-pixel stroke for the highways. And then I could provide uh, another set of symbolizers, it would say, and the rest of my data render them um, with a different set of symbolizers. So you can uh, stack these rules in here and use these filter expressions to determine um, which feature features are selected in, uh, in rendering your data. So I grabbed a, a simple, uh, this is a New York Streets data set, and rendered these. I couldn't differentiate that. The, the data didn't have much variety in terms of the attribute values, but there's a highway here running through Manhattan, and then these surface roads are shown in yellow. Um, if you're looking closely, you can see that these um, uh, roads are cased. So there are two symbolizers. There's like an eight pixel wide stroke and then a, a six pixel wide stroke over it. Um, we intend to provide um, really robust um, 
control for uh, Z index support. Right now you can see I have this one example of a road going under, another example of a road going over. In some cases, the, uh, the Kate line cases don't uh, overlay property, properly, but we want to give you that control so that you can say, I want the, the wider stroke to be all underneath all, let's say have a lower Z index value, and uh, the narrower stroke to have um, a higher Z index value. So next uh, goal would be to let users interact with data. This is an example of just using a, an overlay. There's not going to be any real data here. I've got to really speed up because I'm out of time. But um, this is just an example showing uh, bootstrap popovers um, to add to your map. So I'm clicking on the map, and I'm showing the location where I clicked in this popover. Open Layers doesn't provide a pop-up class itself. But if you're using uh, something like Bootstrap that does provide this jQuery plugin for popovers, you can use that. And what we do for you is anchor that uh, at the location that you, sp that you set. So as I rotate around here, I can see that, um, that pop-up uh, stays in position. As I zoom in and animate, it moves smoothly with the map. OK, that was just really interaction with my uh, location. Um, really, you, you want to typically interact with, with the data. In this case, I'm interacting with vector data that I have uh, rendered <laughs> on the client. Um, this is sort of a nauseating example to look at, but that's intentional. The idea is to show you that we can, our goal is to efficiently render far more features than you actually want to show people. Um, so here are 20,000 points, and they rendered quickly, as you saw. And as I'm mousing over, I'm showing you the feature identifiers for those points. So you should get the impression that this is uh, very responsive. One nice bit of functionality here, too. I'm, my mouse is hovering over one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight features, and I get the feature identifiers for all of those back. So it's not just about the features that on the top there. As I zoom in, you can see that um, um, I get nice animated zooming still with those 20,000 points, and they're rendered um, efficiently. Uh, final goal I'd like to show is just to uh, uh, allow editing. And this is very experimental work at this point, or unstable work, I should say, not necessarily un unstable or uh, experimental. But we have these two interactions that are in a branch right now being worked on, the select interaction and the modify interaction. And these interactions will be composed in an editing control. And I'll just show you um, some of the behavior that those might have. So uh, I'm looking at uh, a states layer rendered uh, on the client here. And I'm going to zoom in um, and show you what uh, the, the select interaction looks like. So I'm clicking. I'm going to double click there. Clicking to select the layer that's shown in a different style. Um, as I hover close to the layer, you can see this point that should show up as I get um, close to vertices in this, um, uh, in this vector data. And then I can just drag those. So this is um, pretty basic vector editing functionality. You can see that I'm, I'm destroying the topology in my data when I'm doing this sort of editing. So what we want to be able to provide is the ability to maintain this topology without um, having it necessarily in, um, without you having loaded a topological data structure or providing a bunch of rules, but just by um, interpreting the user's interactions. So if I get rid of those edits, select a different feature, I'm going to shift click to select a number of other features. Now I have shared vertex editing going on. So as I drag around these points, I'm changing the vertices of the uh, adjacent polygons and maintaining the topology of my data there. So I decide I want to reshape Colorado here. It shouldn't be as big as it is. <laughs> and I like these mountains <laughs> down here. And I can efficiently um, have this sort of shared vertex editing with just some simple user interactions. I didn't have to specify my topology rules. I just let the user select a number of features and move the vertices together. So the final goal I hope that I've um, motivated you <laughs> to engage in is to get involved in the library. Um, we encourage people to become contributors. Please find the, uh, the code on GitHub. I saw some people make a mistake in a sprint earlier. We're working in the OL3 repository under the Open Layers organization. And, um, and then there's a, uh, a mailing list. And 
Um, soon we will have an updated website at this OL3JS.org um, location. And if you're interested in playing around with these examples, you can see this, uh, this whole sli uh, the slides up at this uh, URL, tshub.net, working with OL3. And um, thanks, sorry for going a little bit over, but I hope I've got time for a few questions. Um,